Welcome, and thank you for taking the time out to be here. Uh, but it's going to be a very special lecture. So it's Indian Trade Textiles for Southeast, for Southeast Asia, Lost Histories of the Spread Cloth. Uh, Dr. Parimu Krishnan um, is well known among academics and uh, people involved with any sort of intellectual work in textiles. She's the former center director and lead curator at the Indian Heritage Center uh, in Singapore, and um, has, been, um, has been coming to India and, and involved with India for a long time. Uh, and um, she obtained her PhD uh, and taught art history and aesthetics at the University of Baroda. Um, and she has, sorry, I don't have my glasses on, developed the South Asian galleries at the Asian Civilizations Museum, which is one of the finest museums in Singapore. It's, um, it's uh, I, I remember going there with my children when they were quite young, uh, Gauri, and uh, they were fascinated with the, all the interpretive strategies that, uh, that the museum had, has employed, and I think uh, the museum is really one of the finest museums that I have visited in a long time. I haven't seen it recently. Um, and of course now Singapore has focused very strongly on culture and, and Gauri is on the board now of the all the museums, that board that manages all the museums. And um, there's a new national museum that has started and there's all the Singapore Art Gallery and there are sort of four or five really outstanding museums in Singapore. And, um, and they also are looking after their heritage much better than we are. Uh, so it's really, it's very uh, wonderful to visit and to see that. And Dr. Krishna, Gauri Krishna is going to share her uh, 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 knowledge on um, the textile trade. I'm sorry, but I, I'm speaking a little extempore because I'm not able to, I forgot my glasses. Um, and uh, it's particularly on the 17th and 18th centuries. Uh, little is known about the production centers on Gujarat and Coromandel coasts and how they made their way to Southeast Asia. Dr. Krishnan will share historic significance and artistic lineage of some of these treasured plots held in major museum collections and her own curatorial encounter with, with one in the Asian Civilizations Museum in Singapore. And Dr. Krishnan has authored and edited many books and articles, and she's also the recipient of the Singapore Government's Com Com Commendation Medal and Public Administration Medal for her contribution to arts and heritage. Uh, welcome. Thank you, Dr. Mehta, for this very kind introduction, and thanks to the team at uh, Bahadaji Lad Museum for organizing this lecture and for inviting me for my first public talk in Mumbai. I have attended several conferences, but I have not done a public lecture. So thank you all for coming and uh, for getting interested in the lost histories of the spread cloth. So the term spread cloth, I will explain a little later. Um, so, uh, as uh, okay, I'll use the yeah. So, as um, just uh, <clears throat> explained, we had uh, um, the Asian Civilizations Museum had acquired a major collection of uh, Indian trade textiles uh, in 2009, and myself and my uh, counterpart in the Southeast Asia. Uh, collection uh, division, both of us worked very closely in um, making sure this collection actually comes to uh, Singapore. And while doing this uh, work, we realized that there's so much more to the trade textiles uh, than what we, we knew already or has already been shared through uh, 
either museum collections or through books and articles. So we embarked on this journey, but before um, uh, explaining what exactly we did, uh, I thought it's important for me to, to give you a quick overview of what is the significance of Indian trade clocks and what do we really mean by these trade clocks. So um, th these are peace goods. Um, so India traded and exported a lot of textile. And while doing this research, of course, we came across English uh, as well as Dutch records of uh, export of textiles. And then we began looking at earlier documentation. So we found the Portuguese records. So we almost came up to the 15th century with information on uh, how India uh, exported uh, textiles. And in 2010, there was a major book that was published uh, called How India Clothed the World. So we were actually producers of cotton textiles, which, which was exported to clothe the entire world. So both between the East and the West, we had a huge uh, export in cotton textile. And these cotton textiles were not just bales of cloth, but they were also piece goods which were actually painted uh, with natural dye. Uh, they were resist and modern dye, and they were also uh, trading in Thai dye silk textiles called the Ica textiles. So this is a very, very specialized skill. And for, for those of uh, you who are not aware so much about the production of textiles, it's important to note that um, India produced dye which were fast colors, and we were the only country which produced dye uh, which had dyed cloth, which was fast color, uh, which had fast colors. So, for example, in Europe at that time, they didn't know how to dye color, uh, and they learned the technology from us, uh, from uh, from India. So, this is uh, what the peace goods were uh, called, um, and what is the significance of the peace goods? And this peace goods trade was part of what is called the intra-Asia trade. So we were trading not only to uh, Southeast Asian countries or the major ports in Southeast Asia, but they were also being traded to the smaller islands. Later I will show you the, the map and uh, actual um, the course of how the textiles actually were traveling on the smaller ships from the bigger ports uh, in, as part of the intra-Asia trade. And then came the British, uh, the Portuguese or the Europeans in um, uh, South Asia and Southeast Asia in the 15th century. So we became part of a major world trade in textile. And in this, uh, there was an important role played by spices. So therefore, we became part of what is known as the textile for spice trade. So the Europeans would collect the spices from Southeast Asia bring them to South Asia and in return they would collect the textiles from South, East, from South Asia and trade it to Southeast Asia and it would also go all the way to Europe and also the Americas in the 17th and the 18th century. And the most important in this trade were the Dutch and then of course the English who overtook everybody else. And uh, I also wanted to highlight the fact that these are not just commodities, but they are also creative production of a cultural heritage of our um, coastal regions, especially Gujarat and the Coromandel Coast, because these are the two regions from which our collection uh, comes. And so the focus during this uh, next one hour will be entirely on Gujarat and the Coromandel Coast uh, textiles. And um, also highlighting the fact that uh, these, were, uh, that these were luxury goods and they were also treated as heirloom textiles, luxury goods for the European market, but for the Eastern market, they were not only luxury goods, but they were also treated as heirloom textiles with spiritual and symbolic value. So some of the tribal societies in Southeast Asia, such as Sulawesi, some of these textiles were preserved as uh, heirloom textiles. So they were treated with a lot of reverence, with a lot of respect, and hence they were preserved. So one would wonder how cotton from say 500 years ago uh, can be preserved and how did it get preserved. So in Southeast Asian countries, even though the climate is very uh, humid, they were kept uh, in long houses like this on the, in the attic and um, so they would be exposed to all the cooking uh, fire and everything and so they were, they were 
constantly being aired and they were also uh, not able to collect any insects or mold because they were constantly under, uh, you know, just above the heat. So therefore they survived. So first of all, the, the sheer survival of these textiles is a matter of uh, miracle in our view. So in, I'll just give you a quick overview of what we have been doing with this collection is that we actually did a major exhibition in 2011 uh, and this is, uh, these are a few uh, shots from the gallery, we called it Patterns of Trade because each has a unique pattern and we also studied and compiled the various patterns in our collection, uh, both from Gujarat and Coromandel Coast. Um, these are some of the views of the galleries and uh, we also displayed them through um, region, re on regional basis, on basis of technique, uh, as well as on the basis of typology of patterns and designs. So there were several sections and we also emphasized a lot on um, uh, technique. So we also went to some of the block makers and some of the printers to try and recreate some of the old textiles. And uh, so we also displayed that. And as part of the research uh, tour, we also took uh, groups of people, including our curators, our textile experts. Uh, we had a researcher working with us for one year who was studying dye um, and also um, conservators to different parts of India to actually look at the production centers because um, many Western scholars have also written extensively on trade textiles but most of them refer to the uh, EIC or the VOC, the East India Company and the Dutch East India Company records but no one looks into Indian indigenous records or Indian indigenous production techniques to understand how these textiles were produced and they didn't just emerge out of nowhere. So what is the whole tradition of uh, illustration or weaving or dyeing that is part of a heritage of a certain region, say Gujarat or Koromandal, from where this evolves. So we took that up as a challenge to try and understand where are the roots of some of these motifs, where are the roots of some of these uh, techniques, and where are the roots of how some of these textiles were actually used, or whether they were used at all in the Indian context. So, yeah, so this is something uh, very unique. This is a pattern patola, but this is actually a backdrop which was used in Javanese courts. So this is actually a recreation of a procession uh, that was something that uh, people, the, the textile weavers from pattern found uh, in books from museum collections and they said, if our ancestors could do this, why can't we? So they actually learned uh, by looking at a photograph on how this textile was created. They do not have the memory or the training from their ancestors. They are actually learning on the go from the visual that a museum curator provided to them and they actually recreated this. So there were like eight or ten pieces that they wove uh, from no uh, background, just a photograph from another museum collection. So as uh, I was just talking to Dr. Mehta, we, we should also be supporting the craftsmen today. So this is really what we did was to actually acquire a piece which is based on an heirloom from Javanese court uh, and we, uh, we acquired it as part of the research for this collection. Then of course we have the tree of life, then we have this diamond pattern. These are some of the unique uh, features of textiles which I will explain as we go along. Um, we also used a lot of clothing because many of our textiles were used as yardage, as uh, were sent as yardage, and they were produced as uh, what we call baju or uh, 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 shervani or ajabba for uh, Malay royalty as well as Japanese uh, royalty. So these are some of our um, exhibit uh, details. And um, from here, a few more slides. I will just talk about how we embarked on our research. So we actually went to Patan. This is the Vinayak Sarvi family, uh, whose textile looms have been documented for more than 100 years. So I'm sure probably you also have records in your museum of products from this family, because we have found examples of photographs of their uh, ancestors, I think third or fourth generation ancestors, uh, in the book uh, of Alfred Buller. 
So this, this is something that can easily be traced to uh, the great exhibitions which were held in Europe. Um, and again, uh, this is doubly cut. And other than um, the Patan, uh, the Salvi family, there are another two or three families in Patan. And then their relatives who have now moved out, I think in Surat and also in Baroda, there's one or two families who are doing uh, the, the Patan Patola. The history of Patan Patola almost goes back to Solanki period. And it is said that this group of families were invited from uh, Maharashtra by the Jain uh, ruler who needed to wear one new uh, silk dhoti every day for his prayers. So the Jain ruler actually invited these weaver com a community to settle in, um, in uh, Patan. So that's the origin of uh, uh, Patan Patola. Uh, this is Singh Paya. So the, uh, the two above are actually Patan Patola. But the one below is single ikat, which is uh, different from double ikat. So you can see uh, they are actually preparing the uh, gold thread for weaving. And this is how they do the tying of the um, single ikat, where you can actually see the pattern nearly formed. But when you look at double ikat, it is only on the loom. And after uh, pushing the yarn into place, that the actual pattern, the sharp pattern will be formed on the loom. So that's the difference between single and double ikat. So in double ikat, both the warp and the weft are tied and dyed. Whereas in uh, single ikat, it's only the, uh, the, the, warp, the warp that is tied and dyed. The weft is of single color. So that's the, it's, it's much easier and much faster and much uh, uh, cheaper to produce than double ikat. Double ikat, they can take about three saris or four saris in a year. It's that um, labor intensive. But this family is quite devoted to their uh, ancestral tradition and they are not making any compromise. So they are also using natural dyes as much as possible. Then we move our attention to uh, the Korwandal coast. And here is um, <coughs> a visit we made to a very eminent uh, collector and also art historian Jagdish Muttal and the who is based in Hy Hyderabad and the government <coughs> museum in Chennai which has very interesting collection again very old collections from 19th and early 20th century of block prints as well as painted textiles uh, these are the typical uh, what we call the chintz or the cheat print of uh, painted uh, uh, textiles which are sent from Coromandel to uh, European uh, markets. Um, and this is again a Baranpur textile. So Baranpur is also another very important uh, center of production. And as part of our research, we also found that we, can, we can't just talk about the coast and the ports from which textiles were um, traded or sent across to uh, say, say the western or the eastern uh, markets, but also the hinterland from where these textiles are produced and sent to the port, uh, to the ports. And what are these production centers? Uh, so we managed to find Kodali Karapur is one of them. And this is in Tanjau. Uh, this has a history from seven, late 17th, early uh, 18th century. Uh, this we find, of course, all the way through uh, 17th and 18th century. These are uh, Masuli Patna inspired textiles which are cheaply produced in uh, Coromandel Coast, and this is of course Barangpur, it's hand painted, it's a very, very rare uh, uh, example, almost looks like Persian ceiling painting. So we also then began to understand that actually textiles were produced in both uh, uh, Gujarat and Coromandel, and it was not exclusive that one particular style or design is exclusive to this region or this region. So depending on the market, the availability, <coughs> and the um, readiness of craftsmen to come up with quick solutions. Uh, techniques were actually adapted by uh, craftsmen in both the side, both the coasts, the east coast and the west coast. Uh, we also managed to find examples of mushroom. Mushroom is another very unique textile. It's um, the, the warp is uh, cotton and the weft is silk. And this is actually the textile which is allowed in Islam for the Muslims to wear. Muslims cannot wear pure silk textile, but mushroom is allowed. And so this kind of textile, these are two mushroom examples. 
which were allowed and they were traded extensively to the West Asian market to both Arabic and Persian uh, ports. And so we had managed to find a huge album of textile segments or fragments which were uh, used by the Sarfoji, the Maratha ruler of Tanjaur for book binding. So this was another very interesting discovery. And these are of course the Kodali Karpur textiles, which again were used as examples for book binding. And if you know Saraswati Mahal is the only library um, that has uh, some of the earliest, uh, earliest books, handwritten as well as printed books uh, from uh, as early as the 15th century. They also have a number of manuscripts. And so this was part of the library's ongoing uh, project on uh, binding books that these samples were actually collected. So this is our team uh, which, which, is being, uh, which is being shown the examples by the curator of the museum. Then, as I said earlier, we were also interested in dye. And so one of our researchers looked for the red dye, madder, or it's also uh, known as manjishta. And we wanted to, make, we wanted to uh, find out how some of the textiles in our collection, where the red color comes from. Uh, and other important um, dye that was produced and also traded is indigo. We not only dyed our textiles with indigo, we were also trading the dye itself. That was also sent uh, across to both South and the, uh, uh, East as well as the Western markets. So this is in Vilupuram and Pondicherry where we actually managed to see what, dye, uh, what the indigo plant looks like. And this is a production uh, center where the indigo dye is produced. And this is a dye workshop uh, in Pondicherry uh, run by uh, this gentleman called Yesu, who actually dyes um, the textiles with natural indigo dye. And these are actually wax, indigo wax. So what you can see, this little trough, it has indigo which has been uh, prepared for many, many years. So many of them are actually 10 year, 20 year old um, wax in which the, the indigo is being dyed, is being uh, prepared. And as the textile comes out, it comes out very light blue. And as they oxygenate it, they just strike it like that. And as the, the, the dye gets more and more oxygenated, the, the blue becomes darker and darker. So this was a very interesting uh, discovery. And yet another important center that we visited was Sri Kalahasti for Kalankari. And uh, since much of the Kalankari uh, religious textiles were produced by uh, the uh, painters who were associated with the Sri Kalahasti uh, temple or the Shiva temple, uh, we were also interested to see how this uh, technique or these craftsmen began to make textiles like this, the, the so-called tree of life, and then the Islamic uh, mir mirhab style textiles which were then uh, exported to the Iranian market. And of course there was a lot of Deccani uh, demand for this kind of textiles and how Masuli Patnam emerges as a market uh, for production of these textiles. And these are of course the typical hand-drawn uh, tree of life uh, pieces which would be uh, very much coveted in all the European markets across the board. And uh, these are of course the kalan, uh, what we call in, um, in Malay uh, uh, or in Bahasa Indonesia chanting. So this is the way uh, wax is actually drawn with wax lines and wherever the wax lines are produced, the color will be blocked. So that's where we get the white line in the dyeing process. Anyway, so quickly moving on to uh, our uh, research that I just highlighted. So we did two things. We sent a bunch of samples to study the red dye and a bunch of samples to study the date using carbon dating because we also are preparing a catalog of our collection which is coming out next year and we needed to have accuracy of dating based on scientific as well as stylistic reference. So um, a lot of work has been put in uh, since 2009 in this area. Um, okay, let's look now at the production centers. You're all familiar with Gujarat, and the, the Patan Patola is in this area, uh, and also the various textiles, uh, the printed textiles that we 
uh, we will see shortly reproduced around this area Surat, Kempe, uh, and uh, Baruch, and also uh, ports, which are also ports, and Ghoga is another important port. And places like Baroda uh, were also producing textiles, which were then, and Ahmedabad, which were then sending uh, uh, um, the cargo would be sent to either Kempe, Surat, or Bombay for um, a dispatch to the various uh, international markets. So this is, uh, in, in nutshell, the trade textile network of, um, of Gujarat. Of course, Ajrakpur, that many of you may also be familiar, comes up much later in the 18th century. So when we are talking about the 17th or the 15th to the 17th century, it's only this area which is uh, key. But Ajrak becomes more popular in the 18th and 19th century. Um, I have this very interesting um, quote from uh, Tome Pire, a Portuguese um, writer who was uh, also an um, explorer, a trader, and also a, a mercenary of the Portuguese who came to Kembe and also to Malacca and then realized that there is a flourishing trade between Kembe and Malacca. This is written between 1411 and 1415, which is early 15th century. So when Tume Pire arrives in Malacca, he realizes that there are 1,000 Gujarati traders and a Shabandar only for them, and a equal number of uh, Kling, that is uh, South Indian traders, and the Shabandar for them as well. And so there's a well-oiled business in trade textiles between Koromandal and Gujarat with Kambi. <clears throat> so this, this is a, a very interesting uh, kind of a testimony to the importance of textiles and as we were just speaking, there's not just textile, we also have things like indigo, opium, madder, water, sil silver, seed pearls, other dyes and the number of uh, <clears throat> companies or merchants range anywhere from the Parsis, the Turks, the Turkomans, the Armenians to uh, Gujaratis, Arabs and um, also our, um, what we call the Bohra community, they were all trading in uh, textiles and other uh, materials on this uh, route between Gujarat and Malacca, or Kambe and Malacca. Um, I also visited a, a boat making site in um, Mandui, which is uh, in Kutch, to actually find out what kind of boats were used by the Gujarati traders. And here is an early 19th, uh, a late 19th, early 20th century boat. And this is how the boats are being constructed even today, much bigger than this also, at Mandui. So even though uh, the, the actual handmade boats are no longer in vogue, it is still a tradition which is being uh, followed by the boat makers. And the wood comes from Malaysia, but the, hand, uh, the, the technique of making these uh, wooden boats without any screws or nuts and bolts is still prevalent and there are people who are still making these boats. And there are also research scholars who are camping in Mandui to actually document this whole tradition. Okay, I'm moving on to the Coromandel Coast and uh, I will highlight a few. So Andhra Coast is very important, Kalinga uh, is also very important and then the area around Madras and Nagapattinam is also very important. For cotton is produced in the hinterland of uh, Tamil Nadu and also in the land of Andhra Pradesh and Odisha and uh, production centers such as um, Suripatnam, um, uh, Kulikat, uh, Petaboli, uh, Madras, uh, Nagapattinam, Porto Novo, these are all sites where uh, production of textiles, painted textiles is going on. Uh, right all the way through 16th, 17th century, all the way up to 19th century. And so again we have reference from Tome Pire to what is the significance of the connection between Pulikat and uh, Malacca. And in that we also discover that the earliest um, uh, seafarers were actually the Malabaris. And they would come all the way up to Gujarat, collect uh, from Gujarat, uh, say from Kambe, or Goga and then go down across to Pulika, pick up the cargo from Pulika and go across Bay of Bengal 
to uh, Aceh or uh, Penang, Malacca and Singapore and then from there they would move towards um, Java. I will show you on a map. So these are some of the, the usual uh, trade, uh, traders who were uh, practicing in this region uh, all the way from uh, 15th century that is being documented by Tome Pire, but that means the trade existed even in the 14th, 13th, 12th centuries. Okay, then I wanted to also explore do we get any inscriptional or any epigraphical ref uh, references to uh, trading guilds or trading merchant networks and this is a very early 11th century record from Sumatra which uh, talks about a, a merchant's guild and currently I'm also interested in exploring what are these guilds and how many guilds there were. So there are also guilds not only in the Tamil region but also in the Gujarat region. We have, uh, with the help of a few scholars I'm exploring that. And the term spread cloth actually comes in this 11th century record of Ainuruwar guild which is actually 1001, the guild of 1001 uh, merchants. So it must be a fairly large uh, conglomerate of traders who were uh, specializing in textile who operated in the area of Sumatra, Java uh, in the 11th century and so they agreed on paying a charitable fee for some good cause uh, before they could be allowed to start trading. So to step on the spread cloth means to set up your dukan and start trading. So this, this term comes uh, in th this particular inscription which I found quite amusing. Anyway, here is uh, the quick overview of the ancient trade routes and uh, we already have Barikaza, we don't have Kambe but it's the same area, uh, Haruj, Surat and Mumbai and of course we have Kochi which is the ancient in new series. Uh, and also Tamra Lekti. So this is something that uh, already exists from the first century AD, uh, which connects uh, not only the area no. around Africa, and we have Baraniki because we have an example from Baraniki which I will show very quickly, all the way up to uh, Rome. So this is a well-oiled network already ex in existence from the first uh, century AD. And coming closer to Southeast Asia, uh, as I mentioned, there's Banda Ache, which is one of the major ports. There's uh, Georgetown, which is actually Penang. Then there's uh, Malacca. Before that, there's also Keda, which is also an ancient Hindu Buddhist site, uh, which is not shown in this map, but it's also very important. And then, of course, Singapore. And then down south, we have uh, uh, Jakarta, which was actually earlier called Batavia. And then uh, we also find uh, smaller ports all along the Japanese islands, Sulawesi and Borneo, and all the way up to Philippines, and then of course up to Japan uh, and China. So the textiles were actually traded all the way through the, by, by the maritime route and by land route across to Thailand, um, Cambodia, and Vietnam and Laos. So this is a very well oiled system that was in existence and smaller boats people would come to these uh, bigger ports and they would collect the textiles and then redistribute them uh, within their islands. And so some of the textiles that I am going to show you later actually come from Sulawesi, from Sumatra, from Java and parts of Malaysia. So these are some of the earliest textiles which scholars of textile have been studying. Uh, these are not only dyed, they are also uh, painted or block printed and some of the dyes have been tested and they can be dated as early as 11th century. Um, some of them are 5th century also from uh, Egypt and this is the 13th, 14th century from Qusar al Qadim. All of these sites are in Egypt and uh, there is a very important um, document called the Geniza document which has been found from Fustat, uh, which is this site. Uh, so there are written documents and there are pieces of textile which were found from a large uh, rubbish dump in Cairo. And uh, these can be then, uh, th these have been studied and uh, the scholars have established that these are the textiles which actually came from Gujarat. And uh, so this really takes us back to a very, very early period which is almost uh, 
um, post Gupta or post Wakataka period in the Western Indian uh, region. And um, this is a very large textile. It's called uh, Ma. Ma means uh, heirloom textile in um, Bahasa. And it is one of the carbon dated textile, which we, we see the range between 1437 to 1469. This is based on radiocarbon dating in a laboratory condition. Uh, and it was uh, acquired in Toraja, which is in Sulawesi. Uh, looking very closely, there are actually a pattern of geese around. You can see that it's a block print, right? So the blocks are actually aligned here in the center. And around the block, the circular shape, there is a whole um, circle of geese looking in one direction. And uh, scholars have also found that such geese pattern textiles are also found in Ajanta. So the history of a textile can be actually traced across several centuries. That's amazing. And also Jain miniature painting from 15th century. Um, and also other Jain patlis which also have a row of uh, geese as part of a decorative pattern. So we began to see a kind of pattern em emerging from textile to painting, to mural painting, to uh, uh, miniature painting, to book illustration. So this was very, very fascinating. As part of the similar research, we also began to look at murals and textiles in other museum collections. So for example, this is from Music Ime, and this is from v &A. And we found that these uh, processional uh, kind of uh, uh, illustrations with uh, little arches with a scene from, a, say, a royal court scene or a procession or even going for war or uh, seeing the king and, uh, and, and his consort. So this kind of illustration is also very much similar to illustrations from South Indian temple murals such as Nepakshi. So again we started to, and uh, also illustration of similar kind has been also found at Tirupati, Andhra style painting or the Tirupati style painting. So there are very close uh, comparisons that we can draw with painting tradition and this kind of export textile tradition. Um, then we again began the looking at the structure of a textile because those are illustrated textiles but there are also textiles which are all over or woven and these are uh, some of the early research documents that are produced by people like Buller and Fisher. Everett Fisher, who studied early textile forms, especially with patolas and printed textiles such as these, which are produced in um, Gujarat. So these are actually commissioned textiles, which were sent as uh, hand-drawn patterns, from which our Gujarati um, block makers would actually make blocks. And these are actually names of the merchants or the printers who commissioned these blocks to be made. And so there are hundreds of such books with different pattern designs uh, which were commissioned by Thai uh, royal market. Uh, these were specially commissioned for the Thai royalty. And so this is actually a Thai term um, which, meant, which says um, Maskati. So Maskati was actually a firm, a, a Daudi Bora firm based in uh, Gujarat and Bombay who were <coughs> actually commissioning these and sending them across from Surat and Bombay to uh, Thailand. So this is another uh, interesting uh, document of uh, uh, textile patterns. So this is actually the body textile. This is the border. And when we started to look at these typical borders which we would find in our textiles, uh, we started to look at patterns that emerged from architecture. So we have an example from the <coughs> Sun Temple or the Adalaj Step Well, which also has similar, what we call the triangular tumpal pattern. And so this is part of the looking for the ancestry of the patterns. That, that's the kind of research we've been conducting. And we're finding very interesting uh, correlation with architecture, painting, as well as uh, mural and um, another very, uh, <coughs> again, tempting uh, example is of these dancing ladies, which are very large figures. They are actually similar to the dancing figures that you find in giant miniature paintings, which are quite tiny. But these are huge. They are much, much enlarged. Uh, but follow the same, uh, yeah, the same giant miniature painting tradition of uh, 
aligning uh, a whole row of uh, dancers and musicians. And these were also found, and, uh, as we say, acquired in uh, Indonesia. So these were also part of the so-called uh, heirloom textiles which were preserved by the Torajans or the Sulawesians. And again, do notice the blue and the red, the, the two uh, dominant color schemes that keep coming, the chayu for the red and the indigo for the blue. Just an example of a very early party from uh, Gujarat. <clears throat> Another row of uh, dancers and musicians, which also looks like the similar format that the, the textiles uh, designers have created, and also the row or the band of uh, dancers and musicians that you find in the temples. This is from Bodera. So we are quite tempted to think that the, the people who were commissioned to do these textiles most likely came from the painting workshops uh, in Gujarat and they would have been probably asked to create the main template and then the textile producers may then follow up uh, with their own uh, idea of how to create the, uh, the layout of the textile. So you can see the structure as I showed earlier and then this is of course not hand painted but block painted. So over the years we also find that the, the painting uh, hand drawing tradition, like this is the hand drawn tradition, uh, gives way to block making uh, which is a faster mode of production. And my colleague actually went to Toraja and he found that Torajan artists are still doing the same uh, technique or stay, same style of uh, dancing girls. Uh, of dance and music um, related patterns uh, in um, silk screen. Can I just stop one minute? Yes. Just request people now to take photographs. It's very distracting for everybody else, please. Including us now. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I'm, again, uh, as I was talking about looking for roots of some of these uh, pattern motifs, and I found one of these from Ajanta, a very interesting uh, correlation with the lady with the parrot from the uh, Ajanta cave. Uh, maybe she's a Brikshika or she's a river goddess. Yeah, she is a river goddess here. It's Ganga actually. So it's the same uh, motif of an auspicious female which is uh, reappearing in this textile, uh, uh, te uh, textile uh, tradition. Um, however, what is still ambiguous as we don't know who were the people who commissioned these in the original context, because even the Torajans do not know why their ancestors actually collected these textiles. So we can only take a very intelligent guess. Then we also found that uh, the uh, the female uh, motif also becomes very aggressive for in these cases they are actually building weapons and these are also block prints and so again looking for uh, their connection with temple architecture we also found examples again in western India of uh, feminine uh, uh, representation of um, warriors, women as warriors and we also have more examples from Gujarat again with uh, weapons as well as with Dandia, women uh, participating in activities as part of a procession, maybe they are acrobats, they are showing some kind of uh, acrobatic activity. So this is the full textile, so you can see that these piece goods were never separated and many of them have been found in as many as five pieces and the reason being they were never meant to be used as single pieces, they were used to hang for a ceremonial purpose and I will also show a picture later on of how these textiles were used. So original context, original production and its eventual uh, consumption by the communities that respected these textiles, there's a complete gap and we really have very little information as to how uh, to explain this, um, this, this kind of patronage. Um, yeah, I already spoke about this, so I'll skip it, but just have a quick look at how beautiful this textile is. Um, also notice that this is not a sari, it's neither a sari length nor a sari width. It's a shoulder cloth and in this particular case it's a backdrop, like a wall hanging. So there are different looms that the Indian uh, weavers would use 
for the market, for the Indian market or for the local market and for the Indonesian market. So these are saris, like this, this particular one is a sari, but this is a shoulder cloth. And um, these are, patol, we call them patola pants. This is the full chab pattern of patola, if people are familiar with. Uh, this pattern of uh, circular uh, arrangement of flowers is actually called the full chab uh, pattern. And, and the <coughs> Indonesian royalty would use them as pants. And these are the ceremonial royal clothing in which they would use a sash as well as a pant. And women typically would wear a textile like this as a shoulder cloth. And uh, again, the antecedents for this particular textile we found in the Rani Kiwao uh, carvings, and we found that these are actually like ikat patterns if you look closely. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't know whether we are familiar, this is a Voragaji, so this is also a typical. Uh, design which is again very popular only among the Bora community. So this is not a trade textile but we also found it as part of our collection. So they also made their way to Sulawesi at some point in time. Again our uh, relationship with Jama Masjid in Kanbe and this textile pattern which has a similar geometric arrangement of positive negative uh, spaces of uh, arranging diamond patterns. Moving on to another very interesting uh, and very unusual uh, technique and also a uh, mythological uh, character. I'm not sure if you can actually see very carefully. Uh, these are actually uh, double-headed bird. It's called Gandabhirunda. And in the beak, the Gandabhirunda is holding two elephants and also in its claw. This side is not there, but this side you can see the second elephant. So there are actually four elephants being grab two in the, in the beak and two in the claws. And this is actually how uh, my, my, uh, my, my team has actually uh, cropped the image so that we can actually see it clearly. But this, this textile is also uncut. And so you can see that if it's cut here, they would join it to the other side to make the full piece. So again, these textiles were sent the, and, and they were consumed or used in the same way which means a textile like this could have been produced for say the local market or what is known as the uh, uh, Kalamkari tradition around the uh, Hindu practice of preparing Kalamkaris for temple rituals. But when it reaches Sulawesi, it has lost its context and it has not even been cut and joined together uh, for its original context. Similar examples, these are from um, Golconda. And so it has a very Islamic uh, Persian feel about it. These are of course just geometric patterns. There's no mythological characters. And again, notice the color red. If you keep noticing, the red is very different. And that is because the source of the red is different. There's cheru, there's sapan wood, there are other uh, manjishta, which are different, different uh, herbs, which are used to produce the color red. So the use of color red is, uh, I mean, the, the intensity of red is very different from region to region. And it also depends on the water in which the textile has been washed. So, yeah, again, coming back to another very unusual uh, example from our collection is this Don Bolu collection. Uh, Don Bolu pattern actually means day and night. So if you look carefully, the two sides are very different, even though the pattern is similar. This is a lighter side and this is a darker side. So some of these textiles were, now these were actually used for wearing as sarongs, and many of them actually used to be worn in different ways. Like in the day, they would wear the lighter side, and in the night, they would use the darker side. So these uh, textiles are also used as uh, uh, sarongs. And we have the great leaf pattern, which is again has a very early antecedent in our uh, postart, which is dated uh, to 12th century, and this is from 18th century. So again, as I was talking about, some of the some of the designs continue for centuries unchanged, and that also shows uh, the nature of the market, because market would dictate what kind of designs and patterns are created. 
So year in and year out for se several centuries, some of these techniques, uh, some of these textiles have been produced uh, to meet the demand of the market. This is another uh, Don Bolo type small leaf pattern, which is found in Toraja. And this particular type of te uh, textile would be actually tied onto a uh, buffalo's back for sacrifice. So they would use these kind of text, uh, cloths. So you can see this cloth is actually uh, wrapped around the buffalo who is going to be sacrificed. Uh, this is something that is done by uh, the Torajans every year. And if you look carefully, these are how the textiles, the hangings would be used. So they don't cut them up. They just use the whole length of it because uh, the pattern really doesn't matter as long as it is the heirloom textile. And this particular one is, of course, very significant because it would be draped around the uh, buffalo. So these are funerary rituals which are produced, uh, which are performed, uh, for which these textiles are still produced. So even today, they don't import them from India. They still continue the same design, but they produce them locally. Yeah, this is a decoration of a typical house, which is prepared for the sacrifice and uh, you can see this is uh, the same textile but this is how it is produced locally today. Yeah, Tree of Life is another important motif which we are very fond of and we also ob observe that different markets have different styles. So this is for the European market, this is for the Sumatran market or the Southeast Asian market and again we notice that the colours <coughs> the style of painting, drawing, as well as the, the color scheme and the way the layout of the uh, textile is done is completely different. And uh, looking at the antecedents of the Tree of Life, we of course can trace it back to Gujarati architecture, although the examples come from Koromandal Coast. So there's a lot of cross uh, uh, fertilization or cross cultural exchange of ideas possibly. These are uh, some textiles in, in which we also find Islamic calligraphy and this is one of our finest examples which has uh, Sufi poetry in its uh, writings uh, all across the textile. Architectural pattern is another uh, uniform uh, uh, examples that we keep finding in our collection and we find that possibly these were traded for Burmese market but this is only an assumption. We, we do not have um, any confirmation on that. But these are all hand drawn and if you look at them very carefully, like this particular detail that I have put here, each one is so minutely painted and so uniformly painted. You almost think that it's actually block print but it's actually hand drawn. So this is, uh, as I said, is a skirt cloth. So uh, one of the edges will be seen outside and one of the edges will be wrapped around. Uh, so this is a typical wrap-around sarong skirt or what is also called sambagi uh, in the Malay culture. Thai market is another very unique market and we have a very, very good examples. Similar examples are also found in uh, VNA and also in the Tapi collection. Uh, an example is actually now on display at the uh, Chhatrapati Shivaji Museum. And these were again very finely drawn as, and I showed you the, the pen, the kalam. So the, the white parts of the textile are actually uh, uh, drawn by wax, using wax. So when you dye, the wax part will not get the color. But when you look at the fineness of the lines in these textiles, you, you just can't believe how minutely they have painted these textiles. And this is uh, an example which has been used as a manuscript cover. So they were not always used as either wall hangings or curtains or skirt cloths, but they were also used in uh, monasteries to wrap around um, man uh, manuscripts, Buddhist manuscripts. And a scholar from Thailand is actually working on the Muscati textiles. So Muscati is a um, Daudi Bohra family based in um, Bangkok and Bombay who actually commissioned her to do this research on their family's history and while doing the research she's actually reconstructed these textiles. So actually now uh, there's a whole move uh, to introduce these textiles back into the Thai market. 
And uh, last but not the least, I'm also bringing an example from Sri Lankan market who have been produced in Tamil Nadu for Sri Lankan market or there is now new scholarship emerging which also uh, highlights that possibly there were uh, textile designers in Sri Lanka itself producing textiles of this kind which is quite close to the Coromandel textile which I showed you earlier from the uh, government museum in Chennai. This of course is a, is a very, very modern textile. It's not hand-drawn, it's uh, possibly uh, um, printed. So in conclusion, I just want to highlight again the fact that um, we know very little about these textiles. So there are many uh, gaps and there's uh, amnesia also amongst the communities that produce them and the communities that consumed them or um, respected them and preserved them. And so it's the role or responsibility of museum curators, scholars, uh, and also scientists and conservators to put together a little bit of each and everyone's uh, specialization and try to piece together this story. Otherwise, we in India would really never know what kind of beautiful textiles we actually produced. Um, and also to understand that they were not just uh, the British or the Dutch or the Portuguese who were uh, telling us what to do, but there's also a possibility that there was a feedback loop from the market itself in Southeast Asia, which was through the Thai example in particular. Uh, we know that there was an actual exchange of ideas or exchange of um, uh, maybe um, designers, drawings or sketches which the, the patrons would send to our craftsmen and the craftsmen were not just blindly producing something as a mass production. And also to highlight the fact that these traditions should not be looked as minor or as crafts or as uh, something that is mindlessly produced but that there is creativity involved in it and that we should try and do what we can to sustain this tradition as far as possible. So, thank you. I'm okay with questions, if anyone has any comment or question. Does anybody like to ask a question? No, this is really not for storytelling. They were probably used, that particular painting, I feel they were used as decoration for tents. Either the Deccani tents or the um, Mughals, they used tents as, and these were used as interior decoration for tents. Does that remind me of some yeah, yeah. No, this is not related to the part tradition. It is more, well, they are narrative. But there, there is no real story because they are individual and there's no yes. link. So if there's no narration that links like a Abuji or even Kalamkari. Yeah. Yeah. I was very, very lucky. I was in Singapore at the time the exhibition, so I managed to catch it. It was absolutely fantastic. Mm -hmm. um, I thought it was particularly well curated, and I say that living in London and going to all the exhibitions there, it was so well curated. I wonder if you could tell us one little story, I've forgotten the whole of it, but it was how it was an Islamic textile, it had been completely misrepresented, and then your research showed what the original purpose should have, was for it, do you remember that? It was yeah. Yeah. I, I showed that. That's here. Yeah, that's the one. Yes, that's the one. Yeah. So one of our one of our volunteers actually, she read the whole text. Yeah, and it's it's a Sufi poetry. Yeah. Yeah, it was wrongly read and uh, interpreted. Maybe the, the documentation that we received from the collector, from whom we acquired the collection. So whatever was stated in that, we actually put it 
but then a volunteer actually went ahead and she actually read the entire text. But now, now we have corrected it, and the corrected version will appear in the book. So, Gauria, I wanted to ask you, uh, you know, it's very interesting about whether there were textile designers and the craftspeople were just executing designs that were created by ateliers, and they're sort of, you know, the, the, the sort of influences of architecture. No, this is just my my art historical intervention, really. Just this, that, yeah, um, this is just my conjecture. We are not sure whether the weavers were also themselves the designers. We, we, we don't know that. See, from whatever we know, like for example, in Western India today. Because when I start looking at these large textiles, the giant miniature, te uh, giant ladies that look so impressive and it's so beautifully drawn. So I'm looking for what is a, a what is an extant painting tradition or a, alive in, in in Gujarat today. And the only example I see is the Matani Pachedi. Yeah. So Matani Pachedi is a very very ordinary style of drawing. There's no skill, there's no stylization, there's no refinement. So if you start looking backwards then to what is available from say 18th century or, or even earlier, then we have to move to the Jain uh, miniature studios. And so they were usually attached to a Jain either a library or a Jain temple or Upashray. So again, you don't think that these kind of people would actually do these kind of commissioned works because they would be scribes and artists who would actually work on these small partlies and small uh, manuscript formats. So the only possibility is that they could have commissioned someone to come up with a, what we call the cartoon and then that could have been used by these textile producers subsequently. Because you find them with the same repetitive, uh, you know, rigor coming back almost for the next 400 years. So that's my conjecture that a, a giant atelier would have been have, could have been commissioned to come up with the cartoons, and those cartoons are just being used in a you know repetitive way on going forward into 17th, 18th, 19th century. That's my, my assumption because there's no other drawing tradition in Gujarat, textile drawing tradition like we have in Kalamkari or we have in Odisha or we have in uh, Rajasthan. We don't have any such tradition in Gujarat. So this is my, my conjecture and even the architectural, the Tumpal and all, it's all my, my own observations. This is what I thought was uh, quite interesting. Otherwise, you just say they are beautiful and then you go away not really learning anything about them. And they keep appearing for so many centuries. So what is it that keeps going, keeps, keeps it going? You know, just like architecture, painting, they are all the crafts guilds. They have their own uh, no reference books or their own reference drawings and sketches which they keep repeating from side to side and then adapting it to suit the patron's requirements. So I thought that the similar tradition could have also been carried on in this context. And that's why I don't want to treat them as just mere, you know, brainless uh, printmakers or just, uh, no, printers who are just putting the chap and finishing the job and ending the day. There must have been a creative intervention. It was just a chance, um, someone offered us the collection and we got so, it was like, we almost fall, fell in love at first sight, the moment we saw these textiles. That's, which 
just the journey, the beginning of the journey was since the collection was offered to us. When was that? Uh, 2008, 9. Yeah. So since then, the, yeah, we have been, you know, the, we've been kind of uh, struggling over trying to explain this whole thing. And my interest is really the production. I'm not interested in trade. That, that is all done, it's all written and a lot of scholars have written about it. There are all these figures and you know, statistics, everything is there. I'm interested in the artistic, the human element from, uh, from the Indian side. Like, because if this collection doesn't come to us, if we do not talk about it or see it, all of us will never know this aspect of our craftsman's creativity. That, that's what uh, drives me. Yeah. Could you tell us a tiny bit about behind the scenes what happened when you acquired it? Because I understood that the Met desperately wanted the collection. So how did you get it? When you say it was offered to us, what, what does that mean? Well, it was offered to many people. And so whoever was able to commit first got it. I think so. I couldn't find the money. <laughs> the other thing that I found very interesting is how women have been portrayed yeah. in yeah. such a emancipated way. Yeah. And uh, has any any work been done on that? On on on, on reading uh, just a sort of social history through these textiles? Has that been attempted? Not yet. Yeah, it's very it's fascinating yeah. because of the depiction of people. Of course, you can look at the textiles and the paintings, but it seems to me that the textiles, because it was not such a formal presentation, you actually got a more uh, lively and realistic depiction of yeah. life, you know. Yeah. Whereas when it's miniature paintings, it's mm -hmm. very formal and yeah. it's, you know, more something. True. Patrons who want some stories told, yeah. and so then women are presented in very prescribed ways. Whereas in something like this, which is more, you know, just not seen as such a permanent form, then they actually, it's a much more perhaps accurate or realistic representation of life, day life. Yeah. And uh, they seem to be so emancipated. Absolutely. In the Absolutely. And also some of these textiles were used by women. So yeah. that also shows the, the kind of choices they made and the way they asserted. Because some of this is wealth. Mm -hmm. In many of these countries, in ancient tribal cultures, they treat it as wealth. The textile as wealth. Heirloom and wealth. So, yeah. I'm It's a uh, division of labor. So what I have observed is, uh, and I have asked this question also, and uh, I have been explained that um, all of us do everything. So a, as a child grows, they are taught the basics. So the tying and dying, actually it's mathematics. So each kid is explained and taught this, and women do the lot of tying and dying. Uh, tying more than dying. I've seen them doing, but I've seen in Rajkot, women are also, young girls are also weaving. The, the pit looms, they are used by women also. The large loom, the one in uh, pattern, which has that sloping thing, and it's really huge, those are usually used by men. Yeah, it's quite heavy, but pit looms are used by women. And in whole of Southeast Asia, women only weave. You know, the backstrap weaving, where the strap is around, tied around the back, the, the width is very narrow, it's exclusively done by women. But what I like about pattern is the, the division of labor. Everyone knows everything. So I think that is how they keep the tradition alive and teach the, the usual patterns to everybody in the family. And also I wanted to know, like, the person like me, who's just come out because I'm interested in textiles, I don't have any 
knowledge also. So I wanted to read up on something or have some reference material. Could you recommend something as a start point? Yeah, I'll start jo reading John Guy Bob Woven Cargo. Yes, <laughs> that's the first book you can read <laughs> on Tate Textile. John Guy Woven Cargos. Yeah. This is an ongoing exhibition in London. I was asking you or anyone who has seen it, what significance you have in the context of what we saw here? The VNA exhibition. The exhibition is uh, a whole range of uh, textiles, not just trade textiles. What I showed is exclusively only trade textiles. But they have brought out everything from their collection, which is old and new, like 20th century pieces also and all techniques, so embroidery and everything is in there. So that's literally showcasing India's... Yeah, yeah, it's a, on a grand scale, very grand scale and it's, a, I'm told, a very good collection, I mean very good exhibition because many things which usually don't come out have come out for this show. So, yeah, it's a very important milestone exhibition. Yeah, yeah there's a question in the back. Yeah, the gentleman at the back. Is there any prospects for the revival of these uh, some of the dysplastic drives? Uh, because I mean, in the contemporary period, we have been that a lot of institutions have got plenty of wealth and money for revival of some of the dysplastic techniques and the drawings are to be really finding a good market uh, in the Western part of the world. Uh, well, as far as Kalamkari is concerned, the revival is full on. You can see the market is flooded with good and bad Kalamkari stuff, uh, commercialized very much. Um, I know that some of the Kalamkari artists are also sta starting to use natural dye. And uh, dyers such as uh, what I showed, Yesu in uh, Pondicherry, and a lot of dyers outside, like Japan is uh, literally importing its indigo from India. So they have also gone back into using natural dye. So that is very good. Um, Patan Patola is totally revived. It's not going to die at all. Even Rajkot is doing very well. Uh, I think the quality is going down, but it's still there. Um, this kind of painted textiles, no, there is no demand for it. And also because uh, Southeast Asian market produces its own textile, very fine textiles. So there is no demand for India to produce this for them. So this kind of textiles, there's, there's no possibility of revival. Yeah. Because it was a juncture in history, which is where there was a demand and there was a supply and again the supply was so interesting because sometimes when um, coronal textile uh, people are not able to meet I mean let's say there's a famine and there's not enough cloth or the craftsmen have all died and they are not able to meet the requirement they would go to the, the factor in Surat and say okay uh, coromandel cannot produce this can you produce this so they would go and commission it to the, uh, the Amdavad uh, craftsmen that look, we need so many bales or so many types of cloths, so you, can you produce this? And they would quickly fix something. So this kind of uh, market driven demand and supply uh, kind of a, uh, phenomenon doesn't exist anymore because these traditional societies are also not using these textiles anymore. So that kind of revival, market driven revival cannot happen. If people want to do it as just uh, artistic recreation, that, that is a different story. Yeah. You spoke about Kodali, Karapur, mm -hmm. Yeah, Kodali, Karapur is a particular type of uh, tie dye, uh, resist dye, modern dye, and supplementary weft with gold thread technique that was produced for a particular period in Tanjore court. So this was for the court ladies and uh, also the men would wear it as a turban cloth. So for the royal uh, family this was produced in the 18th century and after the patrons died 
the crafts uh, completely disappeared. The craftsmen didn't survive. So there are a few examples in Calico Museum and few examples in Government Museum in uh, Chennai and I think also in the Tanjore uh, Saraswati Mahal Library. So there is some revival happening but not, uh, not as good as the original. Yeah. So it was fi the fine lines are actually resist paint, resist dye. And then the little, you can't see it in the slide, but there are little threads of gold, which is actually supplementary weft. Yeah, they're very, very subtle designs. Yeah. But some people are trying to revive it through block printing. The, the designs are being revived through block printing. But it's a very watered down version of the original. Extremely rare. Can you show the Kodali Karpur? They're beautiful saris, you can actually see them. Uh, we have talked about women in uh, weaving, so it was nice to hear about uh, men and women being equal so many years back. Our understanding of it has been a little different over the years about, uh, about how weaving has, I mean, I don't know, I assume that we, we always assume in the olden times women were subjugated, so it's nice to know that they're a part of the weaving process and equal to men doing similar kind of work. So I have another question regarding that. I just wanted to understand if it went for the trade in textiles, uh, was the, what, would it have survived? Was there patronage from the rulers? Um, would it have survived without the trade? Was there enough patronage, enough demand in, in the country to <coughs> survive all these years? Uh, yeah, there was royal patronage for certain, tech, uh, for certain uh, designs, for example, Was that I showed from the BNA and uh, music email. 
just coming to that. Yeah, so this particular textile was actually um, uh, painted for royal uh, patron. Um, okay. Anyway, so yeah, this particular was made, meant for a royal patron. And there are many rumals which were painted at this time during the uh, uh, the Rehini uh, ruler's time, you know, the Bijapur, Golconda. So these are uh, also the Varangal uh, rulers, the, the uh, Vijayanagara, Nayaka rulers. So many of these paintings were actually, this is actually the precursor of Kalamkari. Kalamkari comes from here. This is 17th, late 18th century. And then Kalamkari with more paint, make more colors emerges. And here you see a lot of browns and maroons and reds and very little of blues. So this kind of technique, uh, this kind of scenes of painted textiles, as I said, were used for decoration of the inner sides of the tents, like the interior decoration of the tents. And so, yes, there was royal patronage for this. This is very, very fine quality. So even in the textiles that we find from the ACM's collection, there's a whole range. What you find on the bison's back, is very very crude and very very rough textile. Whereas this is something very fine. This is as close to miniature painting as possible. Yeah. So yeah, some of these textiles were found in royal courts, and many of them also has a history of being uh, collected by Amir and other Rajput courts, and then they were some of them were sold out under some questionable circumstances and so they came out on the market. So yeah, there is royal patronage. So they were islands in India too. Yeah, as heirlooms. They were collected as heirlooms by royal courts in India too. But only this kind, some kind, not all, all of them. Yeah. So was indigo used only as a dye or even to paint? Good question. No, indigo was used only as dye. Uh, it was never used uh, for painting. Yeah. Usually they would paint with wax, where the lines had to be white. And, uh, or they would use block also, where the color can be either maroon, but not, which would be used with mordant. So when the mordant is removed and the dye, uh, uh, with the mordant and the cloth is put in the dye vat, Wherever there is modern, the color will be red. Or the earliest Fustat examples where the textile is either red or blue, and where the pattern is, which would have been placed, uh, uh, which would have been uh, um, pressed on the cloth with wax. So wherever there is wax, it's white. And then the entire textile is put in the blue part or the red part, and the color comes. So painting with indigo, no. generally. No. But uh, um, as uh, our knowledge of uh, tech, um, dyes de uh, developed, we had almost five colors that our painters, our craftsmen could actually paint, including yellow, green, yellow. But they were called uh, uh, fugitive colors, so they would um, oxidize or they would fade over time. But indigo and uh, madder would never fade. Indigo would also fade, but madder usually would not fade. So this, this is the fastness of our dye, which was really something unusual. And the French and the British spent a lot of time studying our documents, our techniques, and produced very elaborate documents. So that's another story, how they stole our technology and then improved on it and came up with uh, you know, printing technology in the 19th century. There can be an entire lecture just on that, Yeah, which uh, I, I didn't have the time to cover that. We have French documents and British documents studying uh, technique of painting in uh, Coromandel as well as in Amdavad, Gujarat area and they produce lofty uh, manuscripts which de in detail give the entire technique and how they learnt it and took it back and improved on it and then crippled the entire Indian uh, textile making uh, industry. Because uh, by 19th century, there was no room for our uh, weavers. 
they, they had no jobs because the cloth was all coming from uh, Britain and uh, Dutch and Indian uh, British cloth was flooding Indian markets, Southeast Asian markets as well. So we have some examples in our collection which you can tell this is Indian cloth, this is British uh, power loom made uh, uh, cloth, industrial cloth. So industrial cotton and hand woven cloth, cotton cloth. You can tell the difference. And the entire feel is different. The, the painting, the, the way the motif looks uh, and the, how the dye takes, the, the cloth takes the dye. You can tell the difference. Shall we end here? Yes. Do we have any more questions? The next lecture, the museum is organized.